Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. On the seeds of liberty.com and the conscious resistance.com. So, today we have a returning guest, Matthew Alexander from Ohio. Um, he's an anarchist and author of uh, the sci fi um, dystopia. Would you call it a dystopia? Yeah. Yeah. Scientific yeah. dystopian, I guess, libertarian uh, novel, uh, Wither We. Um, and uh, you can find that on wither.com. Wither, wither Witherwe.com. Witherwe.com, sorry. Yeah, witherwe.com, W-I-T-H-U-R-W-E.com. Uh, you can also find his work on MatthewBruceAlexander.com. And he has a Facebook page, Witherwe. Uh, on Twitter, he's at Witherwe, keeping it uh, consistent, nice. And uh, But he breaks it on, on the YouTube channel. Too bad, people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's on, his name is Semprini on, uh, on YouTube. We'll put the link there below if you want to... Check his workout. He talks a lot about how he loves feminism. No, I'm just kidding. He hates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, he talks uh, some some truth there. Um, so we're gonna talk about last last time we we were you know focusing on the book and uh, talk about his his um, his path to uh, volunteerism and anarchy. And uh, so this time we're gonna do a little more focus on science um, uh, and how mainstream science is a little bit different. Uh, then, well, I don't know, what do you call it, Al- alternative science? Yeah, I, I, I often use the terms orthodox and heterodox. Okay, all right, so there, yeah, we'll but, discuss uh, that, and I, I assume primarily he will discuss that because he knows more <laughs> that than I do. Um, so, so yeah, some topics maybe we'll discuss is, uh, you know, how I, Einstein uh, is, is not the, uh, you know, the demigod that most people make him out to be, and what is the electric universe, and, um, you know, his thoughts about Stephen Hawking, because I just recently saw that uh, that movie about his life, and and also I did like uh, some uh, project that I remember in school about him. I thought he's pretty cool, but apparently he's not such a cool guy. So we're gonna get his thoughts. <laughs> well, I have no opinion on whether he's a cool guy. I just <laughs> disagree with him scientifically. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so we'll talk about that. <laughs> and uh, and also, uh, I think most importantly uh, to our audience is the relationship between mainstream science and the state, and how mm. um, and how the states. Um, <clears throat> You know, monopolization of of anything it touches perverts and uh, and and decimates you know the natural forces that that keep most or, or every market um, you know clean and healthy, right? And which 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 science is not uh, an exception to that. So uh, so Matthew, thanks a lot for coming back on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So uh, so please um, just please get into I guess. Um, an introduction in uh you know like you said what's the difference between orthodox and heterodox science and uh you know you, you know i guess you can talk a little bit about the, the electric universe and and how you know einstein relates to that and we'll go from there well uh an orthodox science is just something that i would consider part of the establishment part of what is generally accepted by the majority of the scientific community uh the the ideas and I would say dogma that informs the textbooks that uh, teach the next generation of scientists that uh, would be orthodox. And then heterodox is anything uh, which, if you pursue it, you will not be published in any scientific journals of note. <laughs> so any any questioning of the dogma, of course. Mm-hmm. So people like Rupert Sheldrake and Wall Thornhill and People like that would be uh, heterodox, and every once in a while, a scientist will start out heterodox, and the the mainstream will eventually come around to accepting him and his ideas. Uh, Christian Birkeland would be an example of that. He was a Norwegian uh, plasma physicist who did some experiments over a hundred years ago, uh, which led him to. Uh, to proclaim that the aurora that we see 
the aurora australis and aurora borealis are electrical phenomenon hmm. related to the sun. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was roundly mocked by the other scientists of the day, Sidney Chapman, probably most notably. And then when they finally were able to send satellites up there, they realized that he was right. So he has since been accepted into the Orthodox, hmm. uh, but he was someone who in his day was very heterodox. Uh, another example would be the gentleman, and for people who saw the other video, you'll remember, I don't remember names very well, but the guy who first came up with continental drift theory, uh, I, I think he died before his theories finally started to get uh, widely accepted. But uh, So there are scientists who will start out heterodox and move into the orthodoxy. Uh, I, I've, it seems to me like bit by bit, the electric universe is starting to be accepted. I mean, if, if I said that statement to an orthodox astronomer, they'd laugh me out of the room, but then they keep talking about, oh, you know what? There is an electric connection between Io and Jupiter. And someone just wrote a book called the magnetic universe, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, they're slowly kind of inching around to accepting it more and more. Hmm. Uh, NASA just put out a paper talking about uh, if we ever visit comets with uh, astronauts, we're going to have to worry about some electrical effects and things like that. So they're, hmm. it's like piecemeal they're coming around to it. But and, as Max, go ahead. And so how long has the electric universe theory been around? Like who was the first to... That, that's a good question. I While there are some older scientists who worked in the electric tradition and looked for ways to connect it to uh, electricity, to some of the phenomena we see in space. I would say that it's a man by the name of Emmanuel Velikovsky. Hmm. Now, Emmanuel Velikovsky is a very interesting story. Uh, He studied ancient cultures and their traditions. And... That, strangely enough, led him to the electric universe. Now, the first time I heard about that, I thought, that's just a bunch of crap. Hmm. But I have completely changed my tune on that. What he noticed was that there were certain commonalities that all ancient cultures shared. Uh, Things that you would not expect them to share necessarily. I mean, we're talking about you know, 5,000 years old and older than that. I mean, very ancient times. Mm -hmm. Cultures from Peru all the way to China, all the way to Portugal, had some commonalities that they shared. And I think I talked a little bit about this last time. If these cultures were not in contact, and these are non-obvious things that keep cropping up again, it had to have been a common experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that was his reasoning at any rate. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, uh, ancient cultures all called Venus a comet. Uh, ancient cultures all referred to Saturn as the sun, the good sun that got usurped. And their their old word for the sun was Saturn. Things like that, that th- there's no reason why someone in China and someone in Italy in 4000 BC should be telling these stories with these common themes like that. Mm. I mean, there's lots more of them. I actually don't know all that much about it, but, uh, and it was just a few years ago, they discovered that Venus has a cometary tail. Mm. Uh, and mainstream scientists will talk about how, you know, Venus has some cometary attributes, Mm -hmm. which when, I found out about that. That kind of gave me chills because all of the ancients called Venus a comet. Hmm. So from when he saw, he he took these commonalities between ancient cultures and he figured, okay, they're, they're all looking at the sky, seeing the same thing in the sky. So what, what's going on? And he tried to reconstruct what he thought might have been going on in the ancient sky based on the testimony of cultures all over the world. And when he did this, he was ridiculed by mainstream physicists and astronomers uh, who had the same reaction to it that, frankly, I had the first time I heard about it. 
uh, one one guy said he wants to change, or he, he, they they basically said you can't planets don't behave like this. We've studied gravity, we know what it does. Mm. This can't happen. So <clears throat> Emmanuel Velikovsky went out to find a way that it could happen, and he discovered that electrically some of these effects he was talking about were actually possible. Uh, that, that's, that, that's really fascinating to me. Rather than looking into space and seeing electricity, he looked at the testimony of ancient cultures and then found that electrically this kind of stuff could happen. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a purely gravitational solar system, none of this stuff was possible. So that that's the beginning of what I would consider the modern electric universe. Uh, then his <clears throat> his descendants and proteges uh, will readily concede that he he got a few things wrong, but that process uh, was an important one. Reading the testimony of ancient cultures and trying to deduce what was happening in the sky that they were seeing that made you know all of them call Venus a comet hmm. and things like this. Uh, and then pursuing it from an astronomical angel, angle, you find out that electrical explanations are superior to gravitational ones. And so you get two different disciplines converging on the same answer, which is the kind of thing you want to see happen hmm. uh, in, in a good theory. So, um, okay, so so Einstein proposed more of the gravitational uh, theory of the universe, right? And yeah, and so and so, w- would you say that he's a hundred percent wrong, or he got some things right? Well, <clears throat> his framework's just all wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, I would have to go with a hundred percent wrong. I, uh-huh. He he was working. I mean, James Clerk Maxwell's uh, equations are are well established so he he knew what he was talking about and einstein was working with stuff that had been experimentally established mm-hmm. but he he invented a framework that i i think is completely wrong in fact it's a framework that i i would say you can reject on a priori grounds i don't think you need to do an experiment to reject einstein hmm. his his theory cannot possibly describe the world we live in. Uh, for instance, adding a fourth dimension. Mm-hmm. There are three dimensions, up, down, left, right, backward, forward. There are no other dimensions. That's what a dimension is. It's a spatial thing. Calling time a dimension just simply doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And space-time is a nonsense concept. So any theory of physics which doesn't pass the simple test of, is it conceivable? Like you, you can't conceive of what Einstein is talking about. You eventually get used to hearing the terms, but you can't honestly conceive in your head four dimensions. Mm -hmm. You can't conceive a black hole, although Einstein insisted there were no black holes in his relativity. Uh, That that's something that came later, but you can't conceive of these things. They, even if they get a, an experimental prediction right, and Einstein's record on experimental predictions is vastly overstated, but even if they get a prediction right, it's not going to be for the reason it says it is. Maybe the math worked out, but it cannot possibly be describing our universe. Hmm. Okay. So I, I, I would reject, there's plenty of other reasons to reject it, but I reject it on a priori grounds, just philosophically, it's not describing our universe. So th- the way I understood, you know, when you, when you, when he talks about space time is that, is that, um, I guess the farther you travel in, sp- or, or, or like when you look at stars, you know, you know, we, we determine, um, how far they are by how much time it takes for the light to get here and so in that sense when you look at out into space you're looking back in time and so to me that's why you know space time that's how i well that's true that's true i mean that 
when you, when you see a star, you're seeing it as it was, you know, given any type of, uh, disturbances that have happened to the light as it comes to earth, you're looking at it as it was when it left the star. That's absolutely true. But he, he, my time, no one knows what time is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what time is. I, I'm more inclined to think that time doesn't actually exist. It's just a perception we have mm-hmm. as we go about our lives. I, I don't th- I don't know that it's an actual thing. Space is just an area that things can be located in. Mm-hmm. Is like you know x, y, and z axes. The space time is a nonsense concept. Mm-hmm. Like there's not. When he, when you see these illustrations of, you, know, you always see a sphere and it's over a what looks like a sheet and the sheet bends because of the sphere's weight and they're trying to show you what gravity is. Yeah, right. And yeah. that's it. That's a three dimensional representation. What he's actually talking about is a three dimensional body not sitting on top of this little bed sheet here, but it's inside a three dimensional space and it warps the three dimensional space. Right. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense. Space isn't a thing. It doesn't have any physics to it. It's just space. It's location. Hmm. It, it, it can't warp. Mm-hmm. Now that, that idea would have been, uh, completely uh, the, the idea I'm saying about space would have been the obvious thing in the 19th century. And Einstein had a lot of people who resisted his theories, I think on, on good grounds, because it, it's just nonsensical. Uh, and the reason that it came to dominate, I don't know, that would be an interesting sociological study. I've, I've read r- rumors of a, a Jewish conspiracy and <laughs> all this stuff. I, I tend to discount that. Uh, Those Jews against everything, I'm telling you. Yeah, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I there may have been, you know, the, to the extent that the press had uh, Jews in it and they saw that Einstein was a fellow Jew, that, you know, there may have been some natural tribalism going on there. But I, mm-hmm. I doubt that there was any sort of conspiracy to put Einstein on top. <laughs> but... Uh, so as to why his theory came to dominate, I don't know. That's an interesting sociological question. Hmm. But I, I do know that it's not conceivable. And if it's not conceivable, then it, it doesn't describe our universe. We can conceive our universe. When someone can point in the direction of time, <laughs> I'll accept time as a dimension. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Until then, there are three dimensions. So... Uh- I want to. I want to also mention another thing that I, I remember reading um, uh, when I read uh, Mishu Kaku's books, who's, who's, who's another mm-hmm. mainstream right <laughs> physicist. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, like he talked about the idea of multiverses mm-hmm. and, and, and how, like, um, you know, our universe is one of many, like, like, uh, like bubbles on an ocean, you know, coming yeah. and going. And, uh, and so what do you think about that that, that concept? Complete bull crap. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Well, I mean, where are they? If, if some, the universe is by definition all that exists. Mm. Now, whether talking about a multiverse is something that we can't get to traveling in the three dimensions we know. Yeah, it it's somewhere else along a different dimension. So already, I'm going to reject it. <laughs> there are three dimensions. If you can point to these multiverses. Please do so. Let's check them out. But uh, it's it, it's uh, not and it's uh, this concept of the multiverse came about to solve some other problems uh, in physics where they said, well, you know, if there if there are multiple universes and we're constantly splitting paths and that solves some some other issues there, especially issues with time travel. They say, well, if you could travel back in time. And you kill your own grandmother, then you won't be born. So you can't travel back in time to kill your own grandmother. So you are born. So you travel back in. So <laughs> right. they say, well, when you you go to a different timeline and a different multiverse, that's part of it. They also uh, it it also uh, solves problems in the Big Bang, which never happened, by the way. But it, looking at the universe as they conceive it through the Big Bang, they think that. The universe is balanced so ridiculously precariously hmm. 
-hmm. There are certain values for constants and effects in the universe that are balanced so precariously to change them by less than a hair's breadth would lead to no possibility of life in the universe. And they say, well, that, you know, I, either you got to believe in God, you got to believe in luck beyond anything we have a right to believe in, or someone's got to come up with an explanation for how we exist. How did this universe get that way? And so the multiverse solves that problem too. And you say, well, there's tons and tons of universes. And of course we wouldn't be around in one that couldn't hold life. So of course, the ones that hold life are going to have the beings who grow up to wonder how they got to be in the universe. Hmm. So, you know, it, it solves that issue, but it, I mean, it's, it's a massive violation of the conservation of mass and energy, by the way, uh, <laughs> an entire new universe just springs out of nothing. I mean, right. that's, that's crazy. And then it's just, it's not conceivable. Like the, uh, the Mishukaku illustration that you talked about, like bubbles in the ocean. Right. Well, that's not what he's talking about. When you're in a bubble, you can travel in one direction, get to the edge of your bubble, mm. go through it, keep traveling in the same direction, and get to a new bubble. Mm -hmm. well, that's that's not what these multiverses are. These multiverses are are somewhere else, mm. but not not a place you can get to traveling in the three dimensions. Mm. Uh, so again, he has to give you that bubbles in the ocean illustration or example, because that's something you can conceive of. Yeah. And so you at least get something of an idea of what's going on, but he can't actually explain to you what's going on because it's inconceivable. He can't actually make a model of what he's talking about mm -hmm. because there's no other dimension to stick these multiverses in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the multiverse is another, another concept that is right out in my opinion. Let me ask you another question. Um, so, so when you said that, um, you know, it, you can't conceive of it, therefore um, it's, it, it's impossible, right? Is that, is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, so no, no one could ever possibly conceive of these things. They're outside the, the possible experience of the universe. So, so therefore, you can reject it on a priori grounds. So, so one one example that he gave that I remember reading his book was, um, you know, a fish uh, in a pond, let's say, who's just you know swimming mm -hmm. around, and then uh, and then somebody sticks their hand in and picks up the fish out of the water, and all of a sudden the fish, from his perspective, he's like in a different dimension or a different universe that he doesn't comprehend because his entire life is in water right that's all he knows and that's all his friends knows <laughs> that's all anybody yeah. you know, all the other so and then he comes back the, the the person throws him back in the water and he's like i was in this place there was no water <laughs> it was so weird and like you're just crazy <laughs> but so, so so that's but the, he can describe it once he's been there yeah and he can tell the other fish about it right such that they could conceive of it he could say suddenly the 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 medium that we were in yeah. became a lot less dense. Right. He could and and you know they wouldn't have a word for dry in fish language, but <laughs> right. he could start talking about the concept and the fish itself, after having been through it, could talk about the concept. Yeah. But <clears throat> there's no way to conceive of a fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. There's no possible way to get. It's not that it's outside our experience. It's not like saying. Uh, boy, I, I had this wonderful delicacy from Thailand. I can't describe it to you if you've never had it, but at least once you've had it, you know what it tastes like. Mm. What I'm talking about is, this is a good question, by the way, but what I'm talking about is an experience you that you could never conceive of. Mm. You can watch Interstellar, mm -hmm. but those representations of wormholes and all this other stuff they're giving you, that that's just their best attempt to translate it into the actual universe we live in. But there's, there's no, there's no wormhole. Um, you, you can't like a, uh, you can, like in a wrinkle in time, you can't bend right. the fabric of time. So the two points come close together because it's not a two dimensional fabric. It's a three dimensional universe. Mm. There's nowhere for it to bend to. <laughs> so it's, it, it, it's not, the fish might not have been able to conceive of the island on his own, right. but once he had the experience, he would be able to conceive of it. 
the, a fourth dimension is something that just can't be. So I, I assume that movie was painful for you to watch, Interstellar. <laughs> I well, I yeah, it was painful to watch for other reasons. I actually walked out early. I didn't see the end. Really? Uh, wow. Not not because I had a problem with the science. I'm oh, used to. Oh, oh, I mean, I love Star Trek. I'm used to seeing science that, uh, <laughs> frankly, is bull crap. And <laughs> that's what entertainment's all about, right? Heck, yeah, exactly. I mean, heck, if I can put up with there will be blood, I can put up with just about anything. Uh, <clears throat> but no, I, I walked out of Interstellar because I just. Thought it was a bad movie. I I don't think Christopher Nolan is a very good director. I'll really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, starting with his sound, I hate his sound. Hmm. I walk into the theater. His sound drives me up the wall. Interesting. Uh, oh, it's it's awful. <laughs> I I and I I just don't think he's a very good director. I don't think he has very good stories. I didn't think it. I thought Inception was better than Interstellar, but I wasn't all that pressed with inside. We don't make good movies anymore. <laughs> not not big blockbuster type movies. There are good movies, but they're all small movies. Hmm. Like Inside Lewin Davis. That's a great movie by the Coen brothers. But that's hmm. a small movie. We don't make Raiders of the Lost Ark, Die Hard, hmm. Hunt for Red October, Terminator hmm. 2, Star Wars, Alien, Aliens. We hmm. don't make great blockbusters anymore. Uh, that's but that's a whole other topic. We're really going on <laughs> tangents now. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I remember reading that. Um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this with you, but um, uh, I think like in the eighties, um, you know, the, the the ratio of original movies to remakes was like, you know, uh, original movies was like enormous, and remakes was like very little. And now it's completely the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> very few originals, and everybody's mm-hmm. remaking. You know, Spider Man again. You know, let's do yeah, let's God. do Ghostbusters again. Let's do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the government's fault. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean that in all seriousness. The Just, government policies have made movies so expensive right. to make with intellectual property and all that. Right, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. You you have to go the safe route. So you buy uh, something that has a pre-made audience so you have a great first weekend. Uh, so that's okay. a sequel, a prequel, a reboot, something like that. Mm, okay. uh, you don't you don't do new stuff. Interesting. So it's so it's a it's a safe choice basically. <laughs> it's a safe choice and you have you have to bring on lots of producers because you no know, one person wants to shoulder the cost of a two hundred and fifty million dollar movie. That's uh, that's new and nobody's heard yeah, of it and that's new and no one's heard of it and is risky. You don't take risks. Wow. Great movies come usually from taking risks. Uh, and when you have too many cooks in the too many chefs in the kitchen, mm. you get the lowest common denominator. They might all have a brilliant idea for this movie. But none of them can see the other's brilliant idea, and so they wind up taking a safe, hmm. lowest common denominator approach. <laughs> uh, whereas if they all went out and made their own movies separately, they might be brilliant movies. But there's too many producers, too many chefs in the kitchen, too expensive. See that N- never, <sighs> never ceases to amaze me how many how many areas and facets of life that that the state perverts. <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is there one that is there anything that it doesn't? Is there anything that it doesn't? <laughs> oh it's so sad uh, but but actually yeah so yeah okay so that's, that's a good topic too so i guess you, i guess you answered the question about wormholes you know you said that because it's it's three-dimensional you can't there's no way to wrinkle it or to, or to you, you can it, reject right? it yeah you can reject it on a priori grounds uh-huh. you, you don't even have to do the experiment or do the search for it if, if it's not conceivable then it, it it's not happening forget it yeah you know the um the first time uh, you know that I heard somebody reject mainstream science um, was the um, the flat Earth people. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. And then you are the second time, and, and it's kind of it's <laughs> it kind of amazes me how you you're so different than them, right? I, I assume. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The flat. I'm not into flat Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can, can you can you go into a little bit of about why that's uh, bunk? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a hundred million reasons. If you ever watch a <laughs> watch a boat disappear over the horizon because it's sinking, right, right. Why can't you see Mount Everest from Ohio? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the tallest mountain on Earth. We can see the moon. Mm-hmm. The moon is way further away than Mount Everest. Right, right. Maybe it's on the other side of a sphere. Who knows? Uh, we also have you know ships, spaceships up there taking pictures of the Earth. It looks pretty spherical. You see the shadow of the Earth on the yeah. moon. Uh, and, then I mean, come, and then they come around and say, it's all CGI it's all <laughs> <laughs> well it's, I, I guess I don't know that they're wrong I haven't been up there myself but right. I, I just have a feeling it's a 
largely spherical planet. One, 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 yeah. of my, one of my interesting meme I saw this, about this was uh, you see an, an ant walking on a, um, a basketball, and it says, see, the ant thinks the, the, the basketball is basketball flat is also. Flat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, how can... What how, a, go, ahead, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to ask a flat earther, why can't I see Mount Everest? Well, I guess I and, guess I, I've I've heard them say like um like to that question they would say like um well your eyes can't see infinitely right okay <laughs> well, why can I see the moon right why exactly. can I see that far <laughs> right exactly <laughs> well uh, heck I mean why why can't I see all sorts of things just travel a little bit of ways and I mean why does the ship disappear over the horizon I mean, that, yeah yeah that's one thing what did they say like so something like it's I don't know. It's, the horizon plays tricks on you or something. <laughs> Some, that's kind of yeah, the, the trick is that it sinks away from you. Yeah. That's the trick. <laughs> it's and, called and, a round planet. And then and then when they when they're in the in the plane, they're like, Well, in the plane you could probably see, right? And then they're like, Well, <laughs> no, it's the, the window. See the window has a I don't know, concave or convex and that plays tricks on you. <laughs> so you de- <laughs> you're deceived that way as well. <laughs> Well, you got an answer for everything, I guess. So, 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 so yeah, I think a good, um, you know, a good way to think about this is that, um, you know, if if the state like, um, you know, subsidizes, let's say, science research or you know anything like, you know, um, agriculture, agricultural subsidies or, um, uh, you know, pharmaceutical, you know, stuff or you know, medicine. Um, we don't reject medicine, you know, we don't reject agriculture, we don't reject science, but we, exactly. you know, so it has nothing to do with those areas. It's really the, uh, you know, the, the state that, that just comes in with all the coercion and violence and just changes everything, you know, and yeah. makes it into something, um, you know, inefficient and worthless. <laughs> science is a process of unlearning what you think you know and proceeding down a different path. And that is an inherently non-conservative process. Mm. With government involved in science, you get institutions right. which are inherently conservative. Right, right. And that is a short explanation for why science is in the state it's in. Science used to be done by uh, the odd genius here and there who had a vision of his own and he followed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, you can draw a parallel between bad movies and bad science. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than have a whole collection of producers, uh, get one who has a vision and let him go with it. Get a director with a vision and let him go with it. Same thing in science. Get someone with a vision, let him go with it. And if he's wrong, well, that's his problem. <laughs> but the the advances in science come from that. Now you have institutions which have become dogmatic. Mm-hmm. They have paradigms that you're not allowed to, allowed to go outside of. Mm-hmm. And the, they preach to you about the scientific method, but they don't follow their own scientific method. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't, there, there's no such thing as a falsifying observation anymore. If, yeah. if you don't accept a falsifying observation, you're not doing science. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, they, I mean, the, it's been documented by many different people, how dangerous it is to have contrary opinions in science. You won't get published. You'll be shunned. You won't get funding. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scientists are human beings and human beings are social creatures. And there are some benefits to being social creatures, but there are some downsides. The uh, people tend to defer to the charismatic individual of the group. Yeah. Even if they're scientists, even if they're trained, they will still I, I've, I've read accounts of string theory that it was going nowhere until the mid 80s when a highly respected physicist actually got interested in it. And then all of a sudden it took off hmm. because now that one of the, the alpha males <laughs> decided that it was OK, then everyone stampeded towards it. That, that's not scientific behavior. That's human social behavior. Right. You have deference to the charismatic individual. You have conformity, uh, a desire for everyone to be on the same page and agree. And if you don't, you get cast out. All of that stuff is part of human social culture, and it's not good for science. Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying I want totally isolated scientists. I mean, you can collaborate and work together, but 
there, we have conservative institutions now. We overproduce PhDs so that there's tons of people going after a few slots, mm -hmm. which means you have to kiss the butt of the person who's deciding which slot you're going into, which means you have to take their theories and accept them. And mm -hmm. that's how you get your PhD. That's how you get your position afterwards. That's how you get tenure. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's just a mess. It's not a good environment for science to work in. We see this with climate change, uh, which used to be called global warming until the earth stopped warming, and now they call it climate change. <laughs> uh, you, you see it with Einsteinian physics. You see it all over the place. And, and sometimes it, it just takes a huge slap in the face for people to finally realize, oh, my goodness, this, uh, this outsider here had the right idea. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the cure, uh, surprisingly and amazingly, it's always to give the politicians more currency and more power. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Every single time, you know, whatever problem, they just need more power, yeah. just a little bit more. Because government has such a good track record of solving problems, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, like one one uh, defense I I, I was uh, listening to because you know Stefan Molly does a lot of great interviews with with people about you know climate change. It's really awesome, and uh, and one of them this, this one guy was saying about how, um, you know the fossil fuels you can think of as as like potential energy, like locked up energy, and all we're doing is freeing that energy. Right. And we're, yeah. we're recycling like, like like this idea that we're polluting or harming the earth is kind of a weird thing because it's like, how does the earth die? Like, uh, how does how does that happen? Like, yeah. you know, it's like we are, you know, uh, we're we're living on the earth. Right. And and we're we're we need energy to survive. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, we we are transforming the resources around us to make our lives a little bit more comfortable and convenient yeah. and 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 that's an evil thing right <laughs> well the, the people who say it's evil do it while wearing blue jeans <laughs> sitting in an air-conditioned office and yeah. i i don't want to hear about it <laughs> you you go out there and live in the brazilian rainforest with a spear and a loincloth and i'll at least accept that you're honest then <laughs> right I'm still ain't gonna swallow your bull crap but i'll at least accept that you're honest i mean she's such <laughs> nonsense so God, frauds, 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 every one of them. It's ridiculous. And by the way, another heterodox position, fossil fuel is not fossil fuel. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Please explain. Yeah. It's, uh, th there's really not much reason to believe that uh, oil comes from decayed organisms. It's, uh, it's something, there's nothing inherently biologic about oil. Now, they have found... Uh, chirality in oil. You know, life prefers one shape of amino acid and protein, not the inverse. We don't know why, but hmm. you can get, you know, a protein like this and the, or protein that's like this and then the inverse. Hmm. Life only takes one of them. Hmm. Oil does display that, but it can, it can get that quality when it rises up uh, through the crust mm -hmm. and passes through bacteria and all of this stuff. In fact, the deeper you get the oil, the less chirality it displays. Mm -hmm. uh, they have found oil in places where there should be no oil so deep that it, it's just, it, it can't be uh, a fossil fuel. It's not coming from life. It's probably produced deep within the earth because uh, a lot of oil finds are associated with helium as well mm -hmm. that, uh, Carry, seems to carry the oil up through the crust. There's no reason why it should be associated with you know, helium coming up through the crust, gas like that, unless it is coming up deep through the earth and it's carried by the helium. Hmm. And there's no known way in a lab. We can make oil in a lab, but we can't do it under conditions like you find on the crust, the mm -hmm. conditions more like what you find deep in the earth. Uh, so oil... Uh, coal is a different matter. Coal, coal comes from plant life, but oil is, some of it at least, is produced abiotically. So, so not from, not from li living organisms, you're saying? Not from living organisms, no. Hmm. 
All right. Yeah. Interesting. Another heterodox viewpoint. I'm full of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if you think of anything else, let me know because uh, yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I have no idea about this stuff. I'm still learning. <laughs> but uh, but please go go into um, your thoughts on Stephen Hawking. I'm curious about that. Well, Stephen Hawking. I don't know much about him, uh, other than the fact that he operates inside inside an Einsteinian framework, and mm-hmm. I completely reject that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he recently said his old idea about black holes is wrong and he's kind of reformulated it. And you have to admire a guy who's willing to do that. Mm. Uh, he saw something that changed his mind and went back on, you know, decades of work. Mm. So, you know, I, I admire that sort of, uh, dedication mm. that he has, but he's just operating in the wrong framework, uh, which is Einsteinian. There are no black holes. Mm. Again, there's, what does it mean to have infinite mass in, or infinite density because all your mass is compacted mm. in a point mm. that's got, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's silly. Uh, it, it's not conceivable. There, there was an experiment back in 1887 <clears throat> called the Michelson Morley experiment. Have you heard of it? Uh, no, but I think the last time you, I had you on, I, I, I vaguely remember that. Did I mention you it? May, okay. You might mention it. It's okay. It, says, you can say it, it was an experiment that went to look for the ether. Okay. The ether being the medium that light travels through. Right. Now, there has to be an ether because light behaves as a wave. Mm. Well, you can't have a wave without a medium. If you take away the Pacific Ocean, no one's going to be surfing. Mm-hmm. The, the wave is simply the way the medium behaves. Mm-hmm. So there has to be an ether if light is a wave. <laughs> and in the 19th century, it was just assumed that there was an ether, and he went to look for it. My, well, they went to look, Edward uh, Morley and Albert Michelson. Uh, <clears throat> the result of their experiment was uh, was announced as a null result. They couldn't find the ether. Hmm. Now, this created some problems. Uh, one, it wasn't a null result. It was misreported. Their result was a lot less than they expected. They expected that the Earth was moving through the ether at 30 kilometers per second, because that's the speed that it goes around the sun. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not necessarily a valid assumption. Uh, they conceived of the ether as a rigid coordinate-like system when really mediums move. I mean, the ocean has currents. Uh, you can move at a certain speed with respect to the land, but not be going as fast with respect to the water because you're on a current. Mm -hmm. So it was strange that they conceived of the ether as rigid like that. So, but their result was that they, we were going at about 10 to 11 kilometers per second through the ether, but it got reported as a null result, which was wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, when it gets reported as a null result, People who think that there is an ether <clears throat> are trying to explain how you get a null result out of that. And without going into a ton of detail, mm. there are two guys called Fitzgerald and Lorentz, and they conceived of length contraction and time dilation, which was a way of showing how there could be an ether and you still got a null result. So mm. those concepts, which you see in relativity, were actually uh, the product of Fitzgerald and Lorentz, hmm. uh, working independently, I believe. And I think the last time I talked about how historians like to credit a single person with inventing the radio, a single person with inventing this, when in reality it's a lot of people each adding their own little bit to it. Hmm. And, and relativity is no different. Einstein gets the credit for it, but he used uh, most of that, of special and general relativity was stuff other people have been working on. And then he incorporated it and added a couple things. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he, but Einstein had not heard of the Michelson Morley experiment. He simply took the idea of this length contraction that Fitzgerald and Lorentz had come up with and then took the ether out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Now that's a strange thing to do. The entire point of the length contraction was and the constancy of the speed of light from all frames 
was to explain a null result in this ether experiment while still preserving the ether. So anyway, that's in, I think, 1905, special relativity came out, general relativity in 1915. Uh, <clears throat> as I said before, they're not, it's, you can reject it on a priori grounds. But there's also, uh, it doesn't really have as good a track record with experiments that people say it does. Uh, for instance, have you heard of the Hafiel Keating experiment? No. It's the experiment where they put uh, cesium clocks, four different cesium clocks in a plane mm -hmm. going around the world, east to west, mm -hmm. and then compared how much time they had gained or lost with clocks that had stayed still in DC. And then they went west to east, and it was, I forget, in one direction it was supposed to gain a few nanoseconds, and in another direction it was supposed to lose nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this was done in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and it was hailed as... Uh, confirmatory evidence for uh, relativity. Complete bullshit. <laughs> they took these four cesium clocks. Now, the, the problem is the cesium decays at a certain rate, and that's how you're supposed to measure how much time has gone by. Mm -hmm. Now, these clocks would have been perfectly useful as an alarm clock. <laughs> but it turned out three of them but when, when you're trying to measure nanoseconds, you need real precision. Right. Well, the problem is the, the cesium clocks have what's called a drift rate. Like they may drift away. You may measure and s them and they're, you know, the, the cesium is decaying at a certain rate. But then you come back later and it's decaying at a different rate. And that obviously is going to mess up your calculations. Mm -hmm. Now, if it decay, if the, it, the drift of the cesium clock is constant, then you can make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. Like it, like the, the rate changed, but I know what the rate of change was. So the drift rate is constant. I can still make my calculation. Mm -hmm. well, the problem is three of them had variable drift rates. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's those clocks are worthless for the experiment to begin with. <clears throat> the fourth one performed decently well. But they took these clocks around the world, east to west, then west to east. In one direction, they're supposed to gain nanoseconds as compared to the clocks that stayed in DC. In another experiment, or, and then in the other direction, they were supposed to lose nanoseconds compared to those same clocks in DC. But the problem is, when they went west to east, one clock would gain, another clock would lose, and then they'd go west to east, and one clock would gain, and another clock would lose. There was no nothing detected any relativistic effects. Mm. So then they started adjusting their data. Now, a data adjustment, you know, sometimes it's called for. Sometimes you're just confirming your bias. Sometimes you think, well, I know this was supposed to gain 250 nanoseconds. I'm going to make this adjustment here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I myself am not qualified to go through and judge whether the adjustments were right or not. What I do know is that sometimes these adjustments were huge. Like, and a clock would lose 100 nanoseconds, and they'd give it a plus 200 adjustment of nanoseconds. Mm. I mean, that's gigantic mm. on, on the scale we're dealing with. Mm. But then they still didn't find any relativistic effects. So they averaged all four clocks together. Mm -hmm. After making these adjustments, three of which had variable drift rates, and then the results were within the experimental error in agreement with relativity. Now, that's a bunch of crap <laughs> because there's, you know, <clears throat> there's no physical meaning to the average of those four clocks. I can say the average length of this totem pole and my penis is five feet. But what does that mean? So what? Okay. I mean, that, that, that has no actual meaning. Right. What the average time that these clocks drift changed from the clocks in DC has no meaning because there is no average clock. 
if relativity is going to act, it's going to act on each clock individually. But none of the clocks agreed with the predictions of Einstein. Just the average of them did. Hmm. Only after they made adjustments. Now, three of the clocks I said had variable drift rates. One performed tolerably well. That clock, when you take away the adjustments and just look at the raw data, showed no significant gains or losses in either direction. Now, I look at that and I say, well, it's kind of a poor experiment to the extent that it means anything at all. It was a falsifying experiment for relativity. But you work your statistical magic with your adjustments, you average them all together, and suddenly it's considered confirmatory evidence for relativity. Bullshit. <laughs> it was a falsifying experiment. But that's, that's what you're dealing with in modern science. And this was back in the 70s. It was already that bad then. It's not gotten better since. Mm. Einstein is dogma. You accept it or you look for a different career. Right. And they don't accept falsifying observations. In fact, one of the, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if this was a letter or something, but one of the guys working, either Keating or Heffiel, I don't know, wrote to his uh, companion before they released the results. And he said, the discrepancy between theory and observation is disturbing. So, I mean, they, they were seeing the same thing, right. but then they made their adjustments. They took the average and now suddenly it's hailed as confirming Einstein. Right. Bologna. That's a bullshit experiment to the extent that it did anything at all. It falsified Einstein. Mm -hmm. it, reminds but, of a, uh, it reminds me of a, a meme I saw recently, which is, um, it's like, it's like new, st new study uh, paid for by Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi is more healthy than water. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, that's what you get with vaccines nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the vaccine studies are paid for by the companies that sell the vaccines. But uh, right, right, right. Yeah. And and and, uh, and the thing is, you know, I was I was thinking about this recently um, about how you know why you know I don't trust vaccines. I don't trust you know a lot of a lot of Western medicine. I mean, I'm an acupuncturist and herbalist, but, you know, I'm not against medicine, but I just, I, it, the thing is, I don't know what medicine would look like if it was not subsidized, if the state was not intervening mm. and, like, um, just meddling with all the economics. I don't know what it would be like, like, right? I, I, no I, one does, I yeah. just have no idea, and that kind of irritates me, like, because... I don't want to. I'm not anti-science. I don't want to seem like I'm anti-science, but we do seem we're like anti-science and anti-medicine when we reject these things. No, 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 no. We we're, we're not at all. What we are is we are uh, sticklers for the proper way of doing things. <laughs> That's, I mean, we're not anti-science at all. I mean, I'm not. You're not anti-sex because you're against rape. <laughs> you're saying that, no, this is, this is not the right way to do it. <laughs> That's, you're not anti-sex. I'm not anti-science at all. I'm anti-big science and anti-dogma and all the other stuff that goes on in modern science nowadays. Basically, what I'm saying is that Einstein is the rape of science. That's that's what I'm trying to get at. Nice, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow, you might be the first one to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. Carve it on my tombstone. <laughs> <I know. laughs> nice, nice. Um, yeah, it's a, it's like it goes back to that false dichotomy that uh, that Frederick Bastiat said. You know that the socialists constantly confuse. Um, you know when we say we're against. Uh, public school that we're against education, right? Yeah, uh, you know, mm -hmm. as if we, you know, we're against we're against uh, you know food subsidies. That means we're against food, <laughs> people <Yeah>. eating. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, that's that's how it's cast. That's the straw man that the statists right you know, like to erect. But of course, that's nonsense. Right. So, so can you? Uh, we'll just just um, finish up with any any books that you uh, recommend. And I'll I'll put them in the uh, in the notes below. Well, uh, Thomas Kuhn's on the nature of scientific revolutions. I mean, that that's a great one. That's an old one. Mm -hmm. I think that's 50 years old. But just science does not progress little by little by little by little by little. You get revolutions that overturn things and a new paradigm. And then science progresses within the paradigm. And then that paradigm gets overthrown. I mean, that's that's the short version of it. But that's that's a great book to read. 
there is there's a good website online called anti-relativity.com, which lays out, I think, an excellent case for the existence of an ether mm-hmm. and an excellent case for why Einstein was wrong. Uh, there are, even if you go into uh, mainstream stuff, there's a book called uh, The Trouble with Physics, I think, mm-hmm. by Lee Smolin. It's a very good book by an orthodox physicist who is pointing out that uh, we seem to be in a dead end and we may have to backtrack a little bit to get science out of the rut. So there are there are some orthodox scientists who are starting to recognize things. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> I am quite convinced that we're not going to get on the right track in physics until we recognize uh, the electric universe. I just read a book called the Higgs fraud mm-hmm. by a man named Alexander Unsicker, a mm-hmm. German physicist of some sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, he talks about what's going on at uh, CERN, uh, C E R N mm-hmm. in uh, Switzerland and Europe there with a particle collider. Mm-hmm. And that's an even bigger mess than I, than I realized. Uh, the book itself he, he's not a great writer. Uh, I, th- I think he needs a good editor to work with him on the book itself, but there's lots of great information in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Higgs boson was not discovered. Uh, it, it's basically the interpretation of certain data, the interpretation resting on assumption, resting on assumption, resting on assumption. Hmm. Uh, there, there's no Higgs boson, and they didn't find it. Hmm. Uh, even if there were, but, uh, that, that's another good book I read recently. Can, can you explain a little bit what a Higgs boson is? For those, those the Higgs, oh, okay. <laughs> called the God particle. Scientists ask themselves, why is there mass? Why do, why does matter have mass? Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> a guy by the name of Higgs, uh, came up with the idea of the Higgs boson, which was a particle that would, the field, and which, created by this particle then would interact with mass or with uh, matter in such a way that it would give it mass. Hmm. And as part of the standard model of physics, uh, which is a mess, uh, there's, they didn't find the Higgs boson. It's crap. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crap. So, so do you think, uh, I assume like, um, like those particle colliders, uh, all state funded, Stay funded and a gigantic waste of your money. Yeah, that, like that's what I'm asking you. Like, like, what's is there a a, a good use for those things, or is it just uh... <laughs> nope? <laughs> there isn't. It's oh, there. It, it's even a bigger mess than I realized when I before I read this book. They're they're colliding particles at high energy, mm-hmm. and they're measuring the product of it. Now. The, a Higgs boson is supposed to live for something like 10 to the minus 25th seconds, hmm. which is, uh, I mean, it makes an eye blink seem like an eternity. <laughs> it's its so short a time span that they, they wouldn't be able to get one into their detectors to detect it. Okay. According to their standard model, which is crap, Anyway, but according to the standard model, when the Higgs decays, it will decay into, you know, two particles and a pro in a couple of protons or something. I I don't know what it is. Hmm. So they're looking for these extra protons. The problem is. Out of 100 billion protons. Two of them will be due to this Higgs boson decaying when they collide these particles. Two. (laughs) So already, not to question their abilities and their intelligence, because I'm sure they're very intelligent people, Mm -hmm. but come the fuck on. You've got 100 (laughs) billion photons. (laughs) And you know, oh, this there's too many photons here. That must have been a Higgs decay. I mean, it's crap. Uh, <clears throat> another problem. So, I mean, they're resting on the assumption that 
they can measure these decay rates, these decay products, and they know that it's coming from the Higgs. Well, you don't know it's coming from the Higgs. Until you actually have a Higgs boson, Higgs bosoning, you don't know what it's from. If you're throwing particles against each other, they're exploding and colliding. Yeah, so you got some extra photons. Uh, another problem with it is that two different teams found the Higgs at different uh, electron volt ranges. Hmm. Now, they were they were looking for the Higgs here. One found it at, I don't know, 125 giga electron volts. Another one found it at 121. It's just the energy involved. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that they're finding things at two different rates should be a real alarm. Because sometimes these extra photons that they're finding, you know, the two out of 100 billion, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're just artifacts of the equipment itself. There have been experiments where someone said, oh, I found a new particle. They reconfigured their equipment, ran the experiment again, and the effect totally disappeared. It's just an artifact of the equipment. Hmm. So they got two teams. They find extra photons in different ranges well how can you say you found the higgs i mean that it's it's just crap the experiment is not repeatable it's not like they're going to build another cern somewhere else and run the experiment again to the extent that it was repeated by these two separate teams working at cern they came to different results mm -hmm. and you do, and even if you have the photons there and can be sure of it and it's not an artifact of the equipment you don't know that it came from a higgs mm -hmm. You found extra photons. Great. You don't know that they're the product of, there's nothing, it's not like the Higgs leaves a residue on the photons. Yeah. You don't know where it came from. I mean, the whole, and there's no one who can explain to you the whole process of what goes on at CERN. There's something like 10,000 physicists working there. I mean, it's it's a make work product for people with all those extra PhDs I mentioned earlier. <laughs> right. What what are you going to do with them? Well, fuck it. Let's build a particle collider. Yeah. <laughs> we'll employ ten thousand of them, and they can stop whining. Well, there's ten thousand people working there. No one oversees it. It grows organically on its own. There is no single person who can tell you all of what goes on at CERN and can oversee the project. Hmm. I mean, the whole thing is such a huge government disaster uh no they didn't find the higgs <laughs> i like the term government disaster i think i think that's a redundant phrase right just yeah like, it just, sure it sure is well like, there can be disasters that aren't government just like, I suppose, so. well yeah that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's government it is a disaster <laughs> yeah <laughs> like like uh, like private property is a redundancy <laughs> yeah <laughs> there you go <laughs> Um, so, so please, if, if uh, people want to um, uh, follow your work, uh, so let them know how they can uh, just pl plug your sites again. Yeah, I, uh, witherwe.com, W-I-T-H-U-R.com, W-E.com, uh, where you can pick up a copy of my book. I've been saying this for a while, but I really mean it this time. My next book is going to be out soon, <laughs> uh, The Preferred Observer, which deals with why people believe what they believe and how they can fool themselves and how... Seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. So related to these science topics I'm talking about, uh, that will be out soon. But uh, witherwe.com, matthewbrucealexander.com, where I uh, have a blog that I ignore, although I'm going to be getting back to that soon. Uh, <laughs> but I do have a website there. You can read old stuff. Hopefully someday I'll get some new stuff on there. <laughs> nice. And, and, uh, and then uh, I'm making anti-feminist videos. Uh, on uh, on YouTube because you're not contentious. There's not there's not enough contention in your life. You need a <laughs> not enough contention in my life. I got to switch. I'm going after Einstein and I'm going after Gloria Stein. You're just not leaving, <laughs> taking you're, them you're, both. You're on. not leaving anybody alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So basically, I'm to find something else. Too. <laughs> so basically, when you said, um, would you say? Um, uh, believing is not seeing. You said seeing is believing. No, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. So you have you, to see, you it, right? see what you already tend to believe, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. And you got to oh, be okay. real careful about that. And it can affect scientists just like it can affect anyone else. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Excellent. Awesome conversation. Great information. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, this, this is like all new to me, so it's awesome to hear. I uh, <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, so if anybody wants to donate to my show, um, you can do so through uh, Bitcoin 
PayPal or Patreon. The links are in the description below. Um, Patreon.com slash Peaceful Anarchism to help me out. Um, dollar per show or or a uh, dollar per month, uh, I ask. Uh, is all I ask. You know, we are capitalists, so we respond to monetary incentives, right? <laughs> in the end. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we do this. I do this in my spare time, my free time, but it's not free, right? Because uh, whenever you devote yourself to something, there are op- opportunity costs, right? There's always a cost yeah. for, some, for everything that you do. Um, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so I love to... Uh, interview various fascinating people like Matthew here, and I would love to do so. And monetary encouragement is always encouraged and appreciated. So, uh, thanks a lot, Matthew. Wonderful conversation. Really, yeah. Appreciate thank it. you. No, thanks for having me. No problem. So, this is um, Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty dot com and the Conscious Resistance dot com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.